We know this D-backs team has stars like Corbin Carroll and Ketel Marte. We know they're one of the fastest teams in baseball, one of the clutchest teams in the sport. But what has been the real hidden strength of this D-backs team this season? You are locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day listening to who? Always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. Please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com to see all of my latest graphic design, my photos, my podcast, all that fun stuff. I've been hosting the Locked on Dimebacks podcast since 2020, and now we get to see the D-backs in the World Series. I'm super excited. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. And thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you. So thank you for listening on all the podcasting platforms and, of course, hitting subscribe to Locked On Diamondbacks on YouTube. Now for today's podcast, we're going to be talking about can the D-backs offense explode once again in segment three? Can Brandon Fock continue this really great run he's on as a rookie in the postseason? But before we get to any of that, I want to talk about the hidden strength of this D-backs team this regular season and this postseason because I think, well, well first, we all know this D-backs team is loaded with talent from guys like Ketel Marte to the Corbin Carrolls, Christian Walker, one of the most underrated first baseman in the sport, going to win another gold glove, near 40 home run season. Corbin Carroll, first rookie with 25 home runs, 50 stolen bases, going to be an MVP candidate. Ketel Marte has the postseason all-time hitting streak. Like, we know this team is talented. One of the best frontline duos. Maybe Zach Allen's been struggling a little bit in the postseason, but you still like him. Merrill Kelly, we saw what he did in game two against the Rangers. Like, this is a good team with good major leaguers. But I think the real hidden strength of this D-backs team is not how they play small ball. It's not their clutchness late in games. I think the real hidden strength of this D-backs team is their resilience and their camaraderie. Tommy Pham had the opportunity to be the first player in World Se- in World Series history to go five for five in a game. But do you know what he did instead? He asked his manager, Tori Lovello, to come and get him, take him out the game, to be pinch hit for Jace Peterson so he could get his first World Series at bat. A completely selfless move by Tommy Pham in a game where he's going crazy, right? He's going bonkers. Who wouldn't want to set up, uh, oh, not just a postseason record, who wouldn't want to set a World Series record? The first guy to, uh, the first guy to do such, such and such, like with how long baseball has been around to still say you can own a record on the biggest stage in the sport. Like that's an accomplishment so many players would want to have. But Tommy Pham, that gesture just shows the microcosm of how this D-backs team has been all season. And I think about all the positive clubhouse guys the D-backs have brought in this year over the last year. And I think about Lords Guriel. He's been such a great culture fit coming over from the Toronto Blue Jays, right? He's one of the most electric personalities on the team. I felt like we lost a little something when Eduardo Escobar left. I felt like Lords Guriel has been a great job of replacing and supplementing a lot of the energy we lost with a guy like Escobar when he left. The purple hair, it's been flowing the whole season for Lords Guriel. And I think the energy he provided those first couple months of the season when he was really hot at the plate, I think that energy is one of the big reasons the D-backs jumped out to such a hot start. I think Lords Guriel was a big reason and a big part of that. He's been a great culture fit for the D-backs this season. Of course, I just mentioned what Tommy Pham did, of course, for his 
brother, Jace Peterson, right, in a World Series game. So he's been great. Tommy Pham just brings, like, a no-nonsense attitude to this team. We know he's not afraid to hit someone if they get out of line. I absolutely love that. I love the toughness of a Tommy Pham. I think he's been a great addition to the clubhouse as well. Then I also think about Paul Seawald. When that dude gets fired up, he's one of the most fired up players in baseball, especially after he closes the door on a huge win. He is one of my go-to guys for thumbnails because he's always screaming. You can just see those fat veins popping out on the side of the neck of a Paul Seawald when he gets a save. He's been electric for the D-backs as well. Those three guys, I think, have been really great culture fits. They all do a little bit different. Like They're not all bringing the same kind of personality. I would say Lord Gurriel is a little bit more uppity. And then the fans and the Seawalds can be a little bit more serious. You probably see a lot more emotion when it comes to like a Paul Seawald. So like they all bring a different branch of emotions and personalities that you would want in a clubhouse. And I just think all those ingredients together make a really nice chemistry little stew that's been great for the D-backs this season. And I have to give credit to a Mike Hazen for finding the right guys to put in this locker room. And credit to a Tori Lovello as well for never losing the morale within the clubhouse, fighting through the struggles that we saw in the second half. Heck, I mean, Tori Lavelle has been here since 2017. I mean, some of these guys were on that 2021 roster, right? Still having the faith of the Ketel Martes and the Christian Walkers behind a manager after a season like that in 2021. Uh, I think it just goes to show you how connected Tori Lavello is with these guys. I know I have a love-hate relationship when it comes to Lavello. I don't always agree with the decisions that he makes on the field, but I can't help it and feel like he's not at least a great people's person and he gets the personalities of his players at the very worst. I, I'm not, you know, I almost called him Ted Lasso. I don't want to go there. Um, you guys could call Tori Lavello Ted Lasso if you want. I guess I'll just throw that comparison out there, but I do like the people person aspect of Tori Lavello. I think he's been really good for the D-backs in that regard. And honestly, when I think about the chemistry of this team, one team that does remind me of, you guys know I love talking about the Red Sox because I did like that team growing up, but the 2013 Boston Red Sox does kind of remind me of this Arizona Diamondbacks team. Now, I know that Red Sox team won 97 games. I know they won the World Series on paper, but I know they won the World Series as well. But on paper, they definitely played above expectations level. When you look at the talent on that team, I think that Red Sox team was the most unified team in the postseason 2013. They felt like underdogs heading into every series, but did not matter. You look at that Tigers team in the ALCS against the Boston Red Sox. I mean, that rotation was loaded. You had Verlander, Scherzer, Fister, Sanchez. You got guys like Miguel Cabrera and Prince Fielder. I think Victor Martinez still like the lineup was loaded. The rotation was loaded. The Boston Red Sox just came up huge in that series as well as the World Series. We could have said the St. Louis Cardinals were also better than the Boston Red Sox. I feel the same way about this D-backs team. They may not be the most talented team. This postseason, but I believe they are the most unified one. Now I want to talk about if Brandon Fott can continue this run that he's been on this postseason. And if you think he can continue that run and get a win for the D-backs in Game 3, then why not bet on it by heading to FanDuel.com because score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. My favorite thing to do is the same game parlay because when the D-backs are playing, this is what I did in game two. Got a little money in my pocket. I took the D-backs money line because the D-backs are 
pretty much underdogs in every game. So you just take the D-backs money line every game. And a lot of times, especially when they're on the road, they're plus money. So that was easy money in my pocket in game two. Then I parlayed that with the D-backs over on runs. Great job by me. So go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of NFL. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. And let's discuss if Brandon Fott can continue this historic run. Maybe not historic. For D-backs fans, it feels historic. I mean, the numbers are pretty good for Brandon Fott the last three games. Um, I guess some of the numbers he has put up has been, has been historic, especially that start he had against Philadelphia. And if he does put together a fantastic start in game three. You can say it's been a historic run for Brandon Fott. So let me not take any shine away from him because Brandon Fott this postseason, I mean, quietly has a 2.7 ERA, which might feel, I don't know if that feels surprising to people if you still have a bad taste in your mouth from his first start against the Milwaukee Brewers. But since then, he's been basically shut down, of course, gave up no earned runs to the Dodgers at a 1.86 year right in the NLCS because he only gave up two earned runs over 9.2 innings pitch. And so in his postseason career, fought five earned runs over 16.2 innings pitch, 2.7 year right. Brandon fought has been really good this postseason. So yeah, getting another start in game three where he puts together a start like he had the last two, you could say it's a historic run for Brandon fought. So let me put some respect on his name. And when you look at the last two starts that Brandon Fott has had, he has really heated up from a strikeout perspective. He's really attacked the zone against the Phillies in those last two starts. Uh, and that was something that you could have been concerned about because we know that Phillies offense, we saw what they did against Zach Gallon, Merrill Kelly. Like, Gallon was not good in that game one against the Phillies. And then Kelly, I thought was solid, but he still gave up three home runs. Then Brandon fought. We knew he was coming off that fantastic start against the Dodgers, but it was like, can he do it again? Or is he going to revert to a pumpkin and just give up home runs left and right? Well, he did it again. Had a fantastic start in game three against the Phillies. And of course, was really special in the closeout game as well. Game seven, only pitched four innings, but still got seven strikeouts in that one. Now, the nerves going into game three of the World Series probably going to be feeling a little different. Now, after coming off a game seven NLCS to send your team to the World Series, you're probably already feeling uh, adjusted to a postseason crazy environment. But the World Series does add another 3% to the pressure that he might have already been feeling. Um, but considering he's already game seven NLCS tested, I, I feel pretty confident that Brandon Fott's going to feel confident in himself in a big game three start. And when you look at some rookies in the past that have had World Series performances, there are a couple that Bren Fott can draw inspiration from. And one former World Series performance I think is a great inspiration driver for Bren Fott is former friend Madison Bumgarner, who back in 2010 was a rookie for the San Francisco Giants. And he had to pitch game four of the World Series. And guess who had and guess who he had to do that against? As a rookie, he did that against the Texas Rangers. So if you want to see a rookie dominating a Texas Rangers team in the World Series, you could go look at former friend Madison Bumgarner. I want to I want Brent Fott to go watch some tape from this start because Mad Bum in this one went eight innings, no earned runs two walks and six strikeouts. Now, maybe that's the higher end of what we could get from Fott because I just don't believe Fott can get to the eighth inning. Like, I just don't think Tori Lovello lets him stay out there that long. I just don't think there's even a scenario. Like, even if Fott has, like, 30 pitches through five innings, like, is Tori Lovello even going to keep him out there? It feels like Tori Lovello is pretty locked into his game plan with Brendan Fott that third time through the lineup. The moment he sees some struggles, the fourth or fifth inning, it feels like Brent Fott is going to get pulled out of the game. So maybe he can't go eight innings, no earned runs like a massive bum garner, but it's at least a great inspiration driver for Brendan Fott. 
If you need a more realistic comparison of what Brandon Fott can do in his start tomorrow, how about we look at rookie Ian Anderson back in 2021, pitched in a home game three in the 2021 World Series against a different Texas team, the Houston Astros, of course. And in that game, Ian Anderson went five innings, no earned runs, three walks, four strikeouts, a much more manageable stat line for Brent Fott to put up. And best believe, if he put up that stat line, we would be ecstatic. Five innings of no earned run for Brandon Fott, who we know has home run tendencies against a team that's basically hitting more home runs at a higher rate than anyone this postseason. Like, yeah, if Brandon Fott can do that, the D-backs would be putting themselves in a great position to win the game. And then the fact that their offense was so good in the last game, you really didn't have to use your best go-to reliever. So if you can get five innings of one to one to two earn run ball from Fott and your team has an opportunity to win, you can immediately go to some of the best relievers in your pen. Go with the Thompson, Mantiply, Ginkle, Seawald quartet, most likely, because Sal Frank pitched a little bit in the last game. So we'll see uh, if the D-backs want to go with him, if Tori Lavello chooses to go with him. I expect a little bit more Mantiply probably in uh in a game three if you need a lefty reliever out the pen and for Fott as well he is going against a team that has been able to be elite this postseason so if he able if he's able to put up an Ian Anderson stat line it would be pretty crazy to be honest this Rangers team this postseason undefeated on the road they have an 839 OPS on the road with 13 home runs, 17 doubles, and 52 runs in just eight games. They also have the best OPS this postseason against righty. So all the numbers suggest that this is going to be a very tough start for Brandon Fott. But with how he's looked against the Phillies and Dodgers, I can't count Brandon Fott out. And one narrative that I'm watching for in this one is Brandon Fott debuted against the Texas Rangers earlier this year. In that start, he gave up seven earned runs and and allowed four home runs as well. One of the worst starts of Brandon Fott's career. Can Brandon Fott get redemption against the Texas Rangers? Merrill Kelly was able to flip the narrative against the Dodgers. He has sucked against the Dodgers his whole career. Never won a game against the Dodgers until his postseason start. We get Brandon Fott now with the ability to change the narrative as well. So I want Brandon Fott to do that. I want him to flip the script. I want Brandon Fott to show that you just can't come into Arizona and expect to win. The D-backs would love a big game three win, and they would love to go up two to one in the World Series. Now we'll talk about can this D-backs offense explode once again with Max Scherzer on the mound? All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Let's talk about this D-backs offense and their opportunity to potentially explode once again with Max Scherzer on the mound because just seeing the name Max Scherzer, right? You're like, ooh. That's a legend in the game. That's a no-doubt Hall of Famer. Yes, he has potential to bring it. Max Scherzer is one of the best pitchers in the modern era. It wouldn't be a total surprise if he goes out there and pitches five innings, one earned run with like six strikeouts. Like That wouldn't be totally crazy, but Max Scherzer is also on the heels of turning 40 years old. He's coming off an injury, and I just don't think Max Scherzer has looked the same this postseason, he's given up seven earned runs over 6.2 innings pitch. And I think this could just be another opportunity for the D-backs who put on an offensive nuclear explosion if all the things go right. I think if this D-backs offense can get going early, there won't be a long leash for a Max Scherzer in this one. Um, considering the Texas Rangers barely used their best relievers in the last game. I think we will see a short Scherzer release in this one. Oh, excuse me. That was almost a tongue twister. I believe we will see a short Scherzer leash. That was, I shouldn't have even tried to phrase that sentence. I think 
Scherzer would get the hook quick in this one. He hasn't looked that good this postseason. I don't think the Rangers will keep him out there if he's starting to bleed to death. If you see a couple home runs allowed within the first couple innings, I don't think Scherzer is going to be out there too long. I think the Rangers will probably have a pretty quick hook on Scherzer considering they saved all their best relievers in game two. Once they started going down, once they started going down early in the last game, once that D-backs offense started to explode, the Rangers start to switch to their bullpen for when you're behind in games. And so I expect some of their better relievers to come out the pen if you know, maybe whether or not Scherzer struggles or pitches well, like you're definitely going to see the D, uh, the the Rangers' best relievers if um Scherzer makes it through four innings of one earned run ball. But even if Scherzer can only make it through two or three innings of four or five earned run ball, we still might see one of the better Rangers relievers come out the pen early. Um, just because you want to put your best guys probably out there. Um with the chance to hopefully keep the game close. Like I think the Rangers are going to try and stop the bleeding of a Max Scherzer early if he starts to get hit early. And so maybe you switch to your better relievers early in this one if you're the Texas Rangers. And that's why I think it's so crucial for this D-backs offense to jump out early against Max because if they're able to do that, think about the repercussions for the rest of the series for that Rangers bullpen. I think the Rangers bullpen, we all know, was already a weakness of this Z-backs team and, excuse me, of this Rangers team. And if you're able to all of a sudden get to that bullpen earlier and maybe do some damage against that Rangers bullpen, like we could really start to wear down and fatigue that Rangers bullpen after explosive game two, come back in game three and explode again. That Rangers bullpen might really start to get worn down. And then by the time you get later in this series, if the Rangers can extend the series, by the time you get to games four, five, six, and seven, that Rangers bullpen will be on the ropes for the rest of the series. So I think it's so important and so crucial for this D-backs offense to jump out to an early lead against Max Scherzer. And it wasn't like the D-backs offense jumped out early in game two, right? They didn't, I don't think they scored their first run until the fourth inning, but they made Jordan Montgomery work. At least he wasn't able to generate his first like swing and miss until like his 42nd pitch of that game. So do the same to Max Scherzer. Yes, Jordan Montgomery had some quick innings, but it was a lot of contact. And I felt like the D backs position players were feeling pretty good at the plate against Jordan Montgomery. I think if that's happening once again against a Max Scherzer, considering this offense. Already had a good game too. I could see some momentum carry over into game three if Scherzer is not on his game immediately. So I do want to see that D-backs offense jump out to that early lead. This bullpen for the Rangers finished. This bullpen for the Rangers had the seventh worst ERA in Major League Baseball, and then the fourth worst ERA this postseason. I want to see that D-backs lineup run it back. Just put out the same dudes that you had in game two in game three so we can just see it once again my only suggestion with a lefty or excuse me with a righty on the mound in a max scherzer maybe if you're tori lavello if you want to get a little bit bold because we know you're not going to move christian walker down i don't feel like that's happening anytime soon feels like christian walker is locked into that clean up hole despite how much he struggles it feels like that's where he is that's fine i love christian walker i just wish he was playing better i'm not even saying drop him down to like number nine i'm just saying maybe number five or number six for christian walker but i don't think that's going to happen so how about alec thomas how about we move him up maybe you don't go moreno walker guriel fam right with four straight righties on the mound move thomas up to a number six or a number five in the lineup maybe put him behind a christian walker Alec Thomas currently leads this D-backs team in slugging percentage this postseason, which is just crazy to think about because Alec Thomas is not a power bat. But this playoffs, he has turned it on in terms of the power department. And so he's one guy, a lefty, of course, that I'm going to be looking out for. Then the other lefty is the star of this D-backs team, Corbin Carroll. He only has two at-bats against Max Scherzer in his career. 
but one of them was for a home run. We haven't seen a Carol bomb since since the NLDS, so I would love to see a Carol bomb in this game. Please also send Carol if he gets on the bases. He's going against old man Max, so please send Corbin Carroll to steal if he gets on. Currently on FanDuel, the Rangers are still the favorites to win Game 3 in Arizona, if you can believe that. So best believe I will be sprinkling some money once again on the D-backs money line. Now that's it for this edition of the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. Come back to maybe tonight, I guess. I'm going to be recording after the D-backs Game 3 victory, of course. So come back to that. Thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. Don't forget to catch every D-backs pitch on their hometown broadcast when you download the Sirius XM app and search up Diamondbacks. Follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for my personal account. Look up Locked On Dimebacks, both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. And of course, stay safe, stay healthy. Doses.